I started my career in tour services. I worked for a destination management company for several years. And in that capacity, you know, had the opportunity to travel across West Africa. And I think what that did for me was it broadened my horizon and perspectives. And it saw me somewhat grow into someone that was paying attention to the unspoken it starts you're know, quite young and, and you see your mom and dad cooking and they're always saying, watch, watch, watch. And you're, it's all absorbing in. And then later on, you grow older and then you think, wait, I got to do this now. And I think I'm actually enjoying it. And then you start experimenting and exploring different recipes. But for me, it's being in the diaspora. You see that you're more focused in the way that you want to represent Africa. Welcome to your favorite podcast, 1000 African Voices, broadcasting from an African perspective. 1000 African Voices is a program aimed at breaking down the boundaries that divide us as a continent, the boundaries that divide our beautiful people. You can also find the show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast by searching for 1000 African Voices. Our website address is 1000africanvoices.com. We are calling this series Africa's Future Reimagined. Your host is Abu Rengui. Welcome. 1000 African Voices. Hello, Africa. Welcome <laughs> to another episode. And today we are joined by Shamain Hombarume. Hi, Shamain. Hello, hi, Brangri. How are you? I'm pretty good, thank you. How are you? No, all good. I'm really curious to maybe understand who you are a bit more before we talk about uh, what you do. So can you maybe just briefly tell us who you are? All right. Firstly, thank you very much for inviting me over. Um, it's quite an honor. My name is Charmaine Hombarome. I am a mother and a wife. I'm based in the United Kingdom. Originally, I'm from Zimbabwe, um, in the sunshine city of Harare. And I just have a passion for food, really. And that's what's got us here. And um, yes, I'm a foodie. So I just believe in what you eat. You should just get a satisfying connection. And what better way than doing it than cooking yourself and seeing the faces of everybody eating and just enjoying it. Hmm. What led to the the passion for food? Um, so you've labeled yourself a foodie. As someone is passionate about food, but what led into that? Were you always that way? Or was there something that sparked your interest in food? You know, what? It, it starts, you know, it starts when you're quite young and, and you see your mom and dad cooking and, and they're always saying, watch, watch, watch. And you're, it's all absorbing in. And then later on, you grow older and then you think, wait, I got to do this now. And I think I'm actually enjoying it. And then you start experimenting and exploring different recipes. But for me, it's um, being in the diaspora. You, you tend to, um, you see that you're more um, focused in the way that you want to represent Africa, you know, in, in, in your cooking, where you ever go to a party, when you're with your friends. And it's sort of like re- reconnected and you think, okay, I need to start specializing those and the distance from home, you know, it makes you go fonder, like, oh, I, you know, I miss that salsa, I miss that chicken, I miss those scents. And that's what I did. And I discovered, you know what, I want to continue the Afropolitan side of things, started cooking, got married, and then the responsibility was mine now to cook. Um, and then my husband and I, we just developed it and revived those meals that we have back home. And it's it's a joy to keep reliving those meals that we had as children and exploring them and then sharing them with our children and our families and our friends that we've made as well here in the diaspora. How old were you when you left Harare? I was 15, Burundi. 
I was 15 when I left Harare. Oh, and, okay. uh, All right. Now, so then you obviously recall quite a bit. And maybe let's go into those fond memories uh, that you're trying to reproduce on the other side, specifically in the UK. Uh, what are those memories and how do you fuse the memories of home with what you're doing now? I think I picture this scenario, Christmas time, every you know, 24th of December, mom and dad have done all the shopping, they're preparing, the kids are, you know, you're, everybody's arrived, all the groceries are there. And then, you know, you've got the chickens that are going to be cooked for tomorrow. So you're prepping them, you're undressing the chicken. And then the food that needs to be soaked, it's done there, that buzz around. And then, you know, you've got the stuff that needs to be cooked the day before, you know, because it takes quite long. So you've got the trotters, you know, you've got the cow foot, the tripe, that smell, the aroma, and, you, and everybody's excited about it. We've relived that here and we've brought it back, you know, and it's it's like that togetherness that everybody's looking, that anticipation that we're all looking forward to do it, to be together, trying to find yeast, you know, like especially right now in, in lockdown time, yeast is gold. It's 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 a must have, but it's such a rare to find. And so stuff like that where you have to knead your dough the day before, make sure it rises overnight. Same thing we're doing now, you know, and that just enjoying that whole process that good food sometimes takes time we need to nurture it and then voila when you cook it there you go it's it's good to go and you enjoy it hmm. and now you're really taking me back i actually almost forgot to answer a follow-up question because my mind is now going oh man i really uh, miss those days uh, given that you are in the uk and you've really chosen to pursue this passion for African food, is it difficult for you to get the ingredients that you need to produce those homemade meals? And I say home in a very broad sense. <laughs> yes. Before lockdown, we're quite fortunate that there are loads of African shops but here in the, in the United Kingdom that were able to, you know, ship food through or maybe family that send food over as well. So stocks were available, you know. So, for example, we have in, in Zimbabwe, there's, there's the, the wasabi mix, you know. It's it's a must-have, you know, when you're cooking your stews. There's the madras curry, you know, items like that. They were very good. They were, they were quite, quite good to find. However, now within the lockdown, it's a bit difficult, you know. You have to travel to another town, you know, to, to, to go and get your, your your specific African ingredients. But, you know, sometimes it's worth the travel to do that. Mm. And I'm sure your family truly appreciates that. And of all the things that you prepare, Shamin, uh, would you say you have a favorite or is it one of those, like, oh, they're all my kids, I don't know which one to pick. Or do you have a favorite, a go-to meal? My go-to meal? Well... Depends how I'm feeling, but I have a variety. But on a good on a on a good day, I suppose you can give me rice with peanut butter with trotters in a stew and some green veggies. Not particular which veggies they can be, but just green veggies, shallow fried with some shallots or onions and just a little bit of seasoning. That's my go-to meal. Hmm rice with peanut butter i think i need to then follow that up i'm trying to picture that so maybe you can maybe take a minute or two to talk us through maybe the preparation of uh, such a meal and hopefully our listeners can uh, more or less follow and see if we can recreate uh, Charmaine's favorite meal okay so with the rice and peanut butter the ingredients you'd need would be the rice preferably basmati rice um, you need some peanut butter. Say we're serving a family of five. I would say you'd need about um, four tablespoons of peanut butter to start off with. So you boil your rice as per usual. Just about the rice has is, is got reached a boiling point. And you can see that it's about to, it's gone, it's gone fluffier, it's gone bigger. And you can, you can just add the four tablespoons of peanut butter. And then you mix the peanut butter and then it actually slowly to actually make sure that it goes through all the grains then 
you cover, um, and then you you want to have sort of um, a thicker mixture so that peanut butter makes it a thick, you know. Then you are you going to sim- uh, cover the the pot, let it simmer. Once you've let it simmer, then once it's done and all the water has boiled out, then you can give it another good mix. Now this is where it gets tricky. If you're quite good at um, cooking sadza, so where you have to um, pound this, the mealy meal, so you're going to pound the rice as well because you want that thin texture. So you don't want it to be like grains, but you just want to be nice and thin. You then pound your rice with the peanut butter, good texture. At this point, you can add a bit more peanut butter. So obviously the first lot of peanut butter was to smoothen it out and then to, to make it not to, not to overpower the rice. Then once you've done that, you cover it and then you can get on with serving the rest of the food. But in my experience, once you've Cook, once the the rice is, has is simmered, you can actually mold it in um you can use anything in your kitchen. It can be a ramekin, it can be a small bowl, and then what you you put it in the bowl and then you serve it onto your plate upside down. If you don't have that, simple cling film will do. Just serve two spoons into scoop it up into the cling film, wrap it up in into any shape, and then it molds it. Once you then eat. Then you know you just unwrap your 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 cling film. If you're fortunate to have our utensils from back home in Shona, we call it muguaku. So you can use your muguaku, and then it, that that cuts out the 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 molding process for you. So you just scoop it out onto your plate, and you've got a nice shape because presentation is key. Mm. That's our peanut butter. Muguaku. Yes. Uh, what is so you spoke about sadza. Yeah. So I think my previous understanding of sadza is that it's in East Africa, it's ugali. In like South Africa, it would be porridge or pap. Am I right? Is that sadza? Yes, that's quite right. In Zimbabwe, it's sadza. It's, it's just your maize meal. You've got different variations, actually. You can have, it can be sorghum. It can be variation from corn or finger millet. They all have different colors. So corn one is white. Finger millet is is kind of a brown looking color, and and mm-hmm. so is sorghum. Mm-hmm. You know, they all have their different healthy benefits. But yes. Okay, and mugwaku, what what is that? Mugwaku is just your wooden spoon, and that's been carved. Ah. So it's carved as um your you know normal dishing spoon, but this one is sort of wider, round shape at the edge there to give you a good sort of a guide to your to a serving oh. of your plate. <laughs> Maybe. A guide. Um, and obviously the, the handle is quite, it's, it's a good size obviously to make it easier for you to hold. And it's, it's quite lo- not, not too long. It's quite short because obviously it's for serving purposes. It's about what, 20 centimeters long. Although mm-hmm. there are new variations now I've seen in Zimbabwe that there's a plastic one, you know, because obviously they have the, you know, people are advancing and you realize resources are there. Yeah. So you can have a plastic mm. mugwaku or a wooden mugwaku. I suppose to get the, the, authentic experience you need the mugwaku the plastic one yeah maybe does the job but that feel of the wooden spoon on your palm i'm pretty sure it's irreplaceable eh? oh definitely because if you started cooking your rice with your wooden spoon that would be mugoti so mugoti is quite long it's the longer because obviously it's to accommodate different sides of pots that you have and stability and you know control of your food so you've got the mguaku, and then you've got the mugoti and the mguaku. The combination, perfect. No, oh, lovely. Uh, Shami, if you don't mind, can maybe just describe your kitchen setting? So I'm trying to visualize you in the kitchen, the family waiting for the next meal. Uh, what's your setup like? What's the, the vibe in the kitchen when you producing whatever it is that you'll be making on that day i'll tell you a secret my kitchen needs to have music okay my first thing ah. in my kitchen i have a radio different to other people but music is the food of love so we play it in the new kitchen so um i have a radio in my kitchen and then we've got a fairly good size cooker here <laughs> being the united kingdom our space is quite restricted so it's got a 90 centimeter cooker i prefer electric one to cook her quite good range and then we've got a grill with an oven we need to have a good cooker 
you know, no matter what food you're going to cook, that will always determine your outcome. And you need to understand your cook. So we've got that. Mm -hmm. And then I've got a few goodies, you know, that I've got that I've, I've collected over the years. My late grandmother gave me a gift when I got married. And it's a, it's, it was like a, a good luck in the kitchen, you know, my granddaughter. It's a, it's a big, we call it Tswanda. Um, Rusero in, in Shona. So it's like a big board uh, made of reeds. So she's uh, that lot wider one. And then we've got a narrower one. Normally you used to store mealy meal in that one. And then you've got my, my, my essentials, my guaku and my um, msika. Msika is when I'm cooking the, the mealy meal, sometimes to, to refine it, it's, it's sort of like a, actually it's a traditional whisker. Because if you look at a whisker, electric whisker, you know the, the 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 components that you eject at the top there, that's what yeah. the music 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 looks like. It's actually quite long, but it's got the same wires at the end there, but wooden. So I've got that there mm. tucked in the corner. My little speciality there, and then I've got you need to. Um, I've got these range of pots, variety of pots. You need to have the pots for the sadza, the pots for the beef stews, the pots for the vegetables. I've got the special pans for the fish. I've got the pans for the eggs and I've got, you know, for the pancakes for the kids, you know, because you have to try and accommodate different cultures now. Waffle maker, you, you know, we, we look at then, we look at the other gadgets that we've got at the top of the, you know, top of the cupboard there. So you'd have a little waffle maker, a sandwich maker, you'll have a rice cooker, you'll have a pressure cooker, you know, you have a mixer, a blender, you know, because... I'm sure my fellow East Africans or uh, North Africans will love their jollof. You know, need a blender as a must to, to get that sauce right. And then we come to the kitchen, to the sink side. Sink has to be clean all the time. You need a good space because as, as people that cook, you know, it's quite important to clean as you go. You know, you're feeding people. So it has to be a clean environment. It has to be... People should love your kitchen. People should come in and want to hang out in your kitchen with you too. So the music is going, food is cooking, cl- plates are being cleaned, washed, pots are being washed, you know. It's a good vibe in the kitchen. And then we've got the fridge, obviously. We've uh-huh. got two fridges, you know, one for the food and one for the meat. You know, we need we need good meat. We need good meat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, What's playing on the radio like now? So now you've taken us to the kitchen. What's on like typically? Typically this week, it's, it's a bit of house music this week. We, we, we tend to go for any versions of any house music because obviously being from Zimbabwe, we've got a hit song called Ngai Bake by Freeman and Macheso, but they've done a house remix. So the South African remix as well. So they've, they've emerged those together. So that, that's quite a hit in the kitchen right now. It creates the vibe. Okay. The weather's great right now. So it's helping with the lockdown. Pretty cold. I don't know. Do you want, to, do you want me to play a sample of the remix? Oh, yeah, to... please. I'm quite curious. A free man, Ngai Bake. Yes. Yeah, um, please. Yeah, take us into your kitchen. Immerse okay. us in the, make us part of the aroma. Ah. Okay. <laughs> Oh, lovely. So this is the remix. Yes, this is the remix, the house remix of Guy Bakke. So it sets the tone, ah. you know, the food is sizzling through, you know, you can smell it. The plate is getting ready. <laughs> Everybody's like, Mom, can we have some? I'm like, no, it's not done yet. Mom and Dad are coming. You know, everybody's there. And yes, it's a good vibe. Lovely. 
free man guy back here. all right no i'll definitely try me some free man i cannot wait to play the full song so thank you for introducing us to that thank you for taking us into your kitchen i'm actually quite hungry now so yeah i'll see when i go to my kitchen i don't think i can really make what you've de- been describing i'll give it a shot and see shot. i do have it would definitely give it a shot i'd love to see your remake ah yeah the, the bar is quite high but yeah i'll see I've got peanut butter i've got the rice but i'm not sure if i can i've never attempted to mix the two but yeah hopefully we will try that i'm really impressed by I think your understanding of your own food and how uh, perhaps your cultural upbringing has informed the person that you are when it comes to all things food and that's sort of the the rich sense that comes through listening to you talking about food so thank you for your willingness to share uh, all of that with us here it's really been lovely uh, listening to you and Yeah just having you taking us into your home your kitchen I really appreciate that thank you thank you so much for having me thank you that was our first guest you will be hearing from our second guest on the other side of this break today we joined by Yawa Hansen Kwao all the way from Ghana hi Yawa hi it's a pleasure to be here Oh the pleasure is all ours I I'm really looking forward to what you have to share but perhaps um just to get started do you mind just introducing yourself to our listeners please Sure it's also a pleasure to be here thank you for having me my name is Yawa Hans and Kwao I'm from Ghana a proud West African and I am the executive director of Emerging Public Leaders. Our organization is really focused on helping to get talented young people into government service. We really believe that if we are to build an Africa that is peaceful, prosperous and just, we really have to leverage the talents, the know-how, the energy of young people to do it. So, I am really excited to be leading this important work. We currently work in uh West Africa and are currently expanding our footprint to East Africa. Oh lovely. What's a public leader? When someone calls themselves a public leader, what does that entail? Well, you know, our organization really is focused on getting young people interested and involved in and kickstarting careers in public service. So, it's essentially work in public service institutions, government institutions. So, when we think about a public leader, we're really thinking about people who are serving in a capacity that is ultimately for the public good. So, the goal of any government government structure or government institution really is to deliver a social good to to its citizens and so our program which started in Liberia over a decade ago has been working to identify young people uh who are interested in careers in public service and we work as an organization that helps to train to mentor to provide them with opportunities and and then we work as a partner to government to place them into actual opportunities so we've been doing this um in Liberia for 10 years and we kickstarted the program in Ghana in 2018 and every year we recruit a talented group of what we call public service fellows and over a two year period they get to work in a government role and so when we talk about public leaders we're really referring to young people who see public service as a high calling and who are willing to um be trained and mentored and and keep their eye on serving for the public good and i mean when uh, people talk about maybe private leadership or leadership within the private sector uh, the key driver tends to be uh, monetary uh, i do wonder um, uh, sort of for public leaders where the reward comes from i know that with some roles 
uh, even within the public space, the, the rewards, the financial rewards can be quite substantial. But generally speaking, as you said, it, it seems to be more of a calling than anything else. I don't know if you have any views on that. Like as a young person, what will motivate me to want to become a public servant or public leader? Well, motivations vary for different people, but the truth of the matter is this. Every nation needs its best and its brightest in public service, and it's such a high calling. So we find that people who are attracted to the path of public leadership are people who are driven by a sense of patriotism, a sense of uh, belonging, and a sense of wanting to make their country or community a better place. Now, oftentimes, you know, there are people who fit that description who end up in private sector jobs uh, for reasons such as what you described. The salaries are higher, Sometimes the prestige and the visibility is more amplified, but, you know, these are the trade-offs that anyone needs to, people need to make in their careers, and young people are still choosing to serve their countries, and it's, it's very inspiring to be involved in this and to see it. But at the same time, it's also very involving. It means that we have to be a voice for you know, providing support to young people who want to remain in public service as a career path, because oftentimes the pathway to promotion is lengthy and unclear, and often it takes way too long to um, feel like there is a sense of achievement or a clear sense of responsibility. And that's why I think our work as emerging public leaders, the organization, is is quite important because we occupy this really important space where we get to be the bridge between government and really amazing talent. And we get to advocate on behalf of these talented young professionals and create an architecture of support that really enables them to thrive and to remain in public service roles in enjoying this like personally i have zero experience um in terms of working within the public sector so um, i'm really enjoying getting a sense of first what it takes uh, but more importantly what it's like to to serve within that space so yep, thank you for for sharing that if i were following in yawa's footsteps uh, so if i'm a young person say I'm eight, nine, how do I become Yawa Hansen Kuo? Uh, like what I'm asking really is what what was your background like in terms of maybe the place where you grew up, where you went to school, and maybe some of the decisions you made along the way that led you to where you are now? Sure. I'm happy to share about my background. I grew up, my family is from Ghana, and we moved to the U.S. when I was quite young. So I had formative years of my life living in the United States. So my family, we, you know, fled the country during uh, the military coup that happened in Ghana in the early 80s. So I, mine is a typical immigrant story, at least my origins, you know, being that strange African girl with the strange name, with immigrant parents that have the thick accents, who, you know, learns how to speak English the American way, because that's where I started my school, um, and then has all of these kind of competing identities as a result of it. So, you know, I'm a multicultural young professional, and it has its pluses and minuses for sure. I started, you know, school in the U.S., and we returned to Ghana when I was in middle school. So, I graduated, you know, from high school and and attended university here in Ghana. And I think, you know, being schooled in two different cultures has given me a really interesting lens through which to see the world. But it's also, I think, empowered me to transcend national borders or or to transcend my nationality in general and uh, perhaps think more globally 
differently than perhaps I would have if uh, my entire life's experience had been in just one place. Um, and I think that that gives me an interesting perspective with which I come to development, because I think that I see the world, you know, through the lens of an African but also I see the possibilities of what could be having spent time in a more developed kind of part of the globe. And I see the juxtapositions of what, you know, even that question of what truly is development. When I attended university, I attended a liberal arts you know, that challenged us to think about Africa and, and leadership through, through a really important and dynamic question. And that question simply is, what is a good society? And I think to have undergone a four-year undergraduate experience that forced me to think about, you know, what what creates a good society was very impactful for me that forced me to think not just in terms of of what i would be but who i would be and what kind of impact i wanted to have on the world both immediately um, and, and in the future. So I have a strong social entrepreneurship background, and I think that that's partly because I've seen two different sides of living, and I've been contemplating this question of what makes society good. So I started my career in tour services, and I worked for a destination management company for, for several years. And in that capacity, you know, had the opportunity to travel across West Africa and to see and experience more of the continent than I did as a child. And I think what that did for me was it broadened my horizon and perspectives, saw and it saw me somewhat grow into someone that was paying attention to the unspoken rifts and differences. And what was really interesting to me in all of the travels was the status of women, whether it was in Ghana or Cote d'Ivoire or Benin or, you know, any of these other countries that we would tour. So shortly after I left that role, I started a women's leadership organization because I felt quite inspired by Africa's women and also, you know, challenged by our position, which in my opinion, wasn't as amplified as it could be. So I spent a lot of my professional life as a social entrepreneur, you know, leading an organization focused on helping to unearth the leadership potential of Africa's women and girls. And, um, you know, I enjoyed leading that work and seeding it. Uh, we founded the organization in Ghana and have worked across the continent, thankfully. And I think, you know, now it's common knowledge that women emerging as leaders is, is important. But back in that day, not so much. I think one of the realizations that came to me as I did that work we focused on mentoring and coaching and providing, you know, employment training. And we did things that I thought were meaningful, that gave women opportunity. But one area that I, I wanted to delve deeper into was governance. And how do we get more women involved in public leadership in the government sphere? How do we get more women into politics, rising through the ranks as political leaders? How do we get more women parliamentarians? How do we get more women as technical leaders in ministries or departments or agencies in government institutions? And the statistics show that women were sorely underrepresented in all of these. So that was a question. These were questions that just would not go away and partly led me to the path that I'm on now, working in the government governance space, creating opportunity, not just for women now, but for women and men across the continent to enter into uh, government leadership and to create opportunities so that, you know, the next 
chapter of Africa's future that we're writing is filled. You know, the pipeline of talent for public sector is just as filled and brimming as it is for the private sector. So that in a nutshell in a, and in a very meandering route <laughs> has been my professional journey and it's led me to this point. I mean, on 1000 African Voices, the reason we do long form interviews is so that we can from time to time meander because I find it is in the meandering where we get to really learn quite a bit do a few deep dives. So yeah, the, the more of that, the better. But I find personally to sit back and just hear your views is really why we created the platform. Something in what you just said now really stuck uh, with me. It's more on the next chapter of uh, the African continent. For a few years now, we've been talking about the new Africa but one does wonder at times what that really entails. And I'm sure we've got slightly different interpretations of what that new Africa needs to look and feel like. If you don't mind, maybe just sharing your perspective on maybe how you see the future of Africa, given that not only has a lot been written, but as mentioned, for at least the last 15, 20 years, we have been waiting for this new chapter. What's your sense in terms of what that chapter needs to, to look like? Well, I think that whether we like it or not, a new chapter is upon us. And I think the, the happenings or the goings-on of this past year are proof of that. Life is shifting. And... I, I think that whether or not the continent is ready, there are these shifts that will invariably impact the future. But I see Africa's future with, with the eyes of hope. And it's partly because of the young people that I get to work with. I see the, the energy. I see the hope. I see the aspirations for better. But there are some other trends that I think are necessitating change and are driving this sense of urgency to improve the continent in general. And, and here are a couple of those things. I think first, I see that there seems to be, whether intentional or not, there are more movements of, of citizens who are um, protesting what they view as wrong. We're seeing more and more dictatorships topple, some more quickly than others, but we're seeing democracy being entrenched in many countries, even if it's imperfect, it's being entrenched. Other countries have centuries of experience running democratic processes, and yet in recent weeks, we've seen that even they have cracks in, in implementation. So... I have a hopefulness because I do see that people are finding their voice. I think that, you know, the advances that we're acknowledging or, or, or leveraging in technology are making, you know, learning and knowledge a little more ubiquitous than it used to be. And I think in many ways, it's leveling the playing field for access so that if you will take the knowledge and run with it, you too can, you know, maximize your potential and hopefully, you know, turn a profit and improve your lot and the lot of others. I think that things like the Africa Continental Free Trade Area and uh, the fact that an agreement of sorts has been mostly ratified and is in somewhat <laughs> of an effect. Of course, COVID has been a disruptor to that. You know, these regional blocks are, you know, weak in some areas, but they exist and there's regional cooperation and continental cooperation. And I, I think that we can look at the cup as half empty, but I choose to see it as it's filling. It's on its way there. And I think that if we collectively just become unrelenting in our desire for the best for Africa, then we would be on that pathway 
And one of those essential ingredients is really excellent, talented, and ethical people in government service. And I think that, you know, the day of the strongman is essentially done. It's now time to build strong institutions of state that can weather the storms, that no matter who's president, <laughs> who's, you know, the figurehead or the, the head of the, the political leadership, that the institutions are strong enough to continue to provide for the needs of, of citizens everywhere. And so that's my assessment of, of where things are and where we're trending. And I think that, you know, the new Africa isn't so much a new Africa, but it's almost like I want to use the word woke. You know, I borrow that reference from, you know, some 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 of the civil rights activism and, and the Black uh, Lives Matter movement. But there's like an awakening that is happening that I think is very positive. We see a lot of people who have spent time abroad who are finding their way back home. I think the linkages that are being forged between Africa or Africans on the continent and Africans in the diaspora is also a strong linkage. And I think all of these things combined, not one of them individually does it all, but all of these factors combined have a way of really creating the systems, the structures that will enable Africa to be truly peaceful, prosperous, and just. As you were talking, I was sort of trying to imagine, and it goes back to uh, the question I asked earlier about how you became the person that you are today. One of the questions that fascinates me quite a bit is to try and understand how someone spends their day. So mm -hmm. if I share my day typically uh, comprises you wake up, I'll tell myself I'm going to run for 10 kilometers inevitably. I never get to the 10, but I'll sort of always every day attempt to do that. Come back home, make breakfast, etc. What's the what's your typical day? Like if you have such a thing as a typical day, sort of from the time you get up to uh, whenever your bedtime is, sort of what goes into a typical Yawa day? Well, I wouldn't call my days typical, but there are some constants. So maybe let me talk about the things that are constant. When I do wake up, I do spend some time in prayer and meditation. I like to be quiet and just reflect and, and listen. I think that, you know, my faith plays such an important directional role in my life, that that's the first thing I like to do when I get up, to, to kind of pray and listen. And, you know, I plan my day before the day, so I pretty much have an idea of, you know, what my work commitments are, and so that usually informs, you know, what time the official work day begins. But I do have a family, so I, I do usually make breakfast, and we try and kind of check in with each other and do a few household chores. Those are kind of the constants. And I think in this past year where we've mostly been working from home, it's become a bit more routine that we kind of check in in the morning and check in in the evening before bed. But those touch bases with family, that check-in, spiritual check-in in, in, in the morning hours, those are my constants. And the rest is just, you know, kind of plug and play based on what's going on professionally. I'm quite conscious of the time that we have. It's one of those conversations where uh, by the time they end, I am still left with so many questions. And perhaps there's a, a conversation to be had in future because uh, I, for one, will be following closely to see uh, what you get up to. Uh, voices such as yours are voices that need to be amplified if we are to realize this Africa that uh, the majority of us want. And so I don't know if there are any uh, last words, Yawa, that you'd like to leave with our listeners, but I've really, really enjoyed getting your perspective, uh, particularly on the continent that we call Africa. Any last words before we say goodbye? 
Well, thank you for having me. It's been such a pleasure. And I just want to encourage everyone listening to do your part to make Africa the kind of continent that you would not want to leave. On that note, Yawa Hansen Kwa, it's really been a pleasure. Thank you, thank you for your time. Uh, hopefully our paths will cross at some point. Uh, do take care and all the best with all your endeavors. Because when you succeed, I think the, the continent succeeds. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. I wish you likewise. Cheers. Take care. Cheers. Bye. 1000 African Voices. You've been listening to 1000 African Voices. Please join us next time as we bring you another African voice. 1000 African Voices is produced by me, Aburengui, with Sam Garnich on sound production. For more information, including the contact details of our guests, visit us on our website, 1000africanvoices.com. You can also subscribe to our show on iTunes by searching for 1000 African Voices. Please help us grow the project by logging on to 1000africanvoices.com to subscribe. Until next time, Kungana Africa and take care.